Welcome back to Open Line tonight. We are talking about vaping and teens, and we're going to zigzag into coronavirus here eventually. So if you want to give us a call, go ahead and uh, call in now. 615-737-PLUS is the number. Uh, our wonderful panel is here, and Dr. Mangelardi, you were telling me there is actually a test that parents can give their kids if they want to find out if they're vaping or not. I had no idea about this. Well, nicotine uh, ingestion, it's any, any way you take in nicotine, you end up with cotinine, which is a metabolite of nicotine in the urine. And there are very inexpensive tests that are available that parents can buy at drugstores or order online, uh, less than a dollar a test, where uh, you simply have the kid urinate into a cup, dip, dip the urine, wait about uh, one or two minutes and it's like a home pregnancy mm -hmm. test it just you look at the readout and you know immediately whether they've used the product in the last week or two and it's not necessarily for everyone but it is an option uh, for parents that feel like they have a need to do that sure and it's a way to hold your student or your child accountable it also may give them a pass with their friends Yes, uh, it sort of gives them plausible deniability. Yeah. A lot of these kids don't want to be vaping, but they have peer pressure mm -hmm. to do it or they want to look cool in front of their friends. Yeah. And if they know that their parents will find out and that there'll be consequences, yeah. then they can say to their friends, hey, you know, I'd much prefer to go to the Friday night football game, mm -hmm. not be grounded, yeah. than uh, take that one puff off of this vaping product. But this is something you can easily find at your Walgreens or CVS or wherever. Yes. Just and, you know, I think, as I alluded to earlier, the brain of the 16-year-old is different than the brain of a 22-year-old. And I think what we all want to do with our kids is to kind of let them have fun but keep them within the guardrail sure. so they don't do permanent damage. Yeah. They don't permanently damage their brain so that they're hooked on nicotine for the rest of their lives. And this is a tool that's available um, among other things that people could do. You've mentioned the brain of a child is different than the adult. Are the lungs of a child different than an adult that makes them more susceptible to these terrible illnesses? Uh, certainly uh, people are susceptible at different ages to different things. Uh, I don't know that a teenager's young is more or less susceptible to the damages of vaping than an adult. Um, uh, but teenagers may be more likely to use street mm -hmm. products, uh, yeah. product sort of homemade street products that have these additives that can lead to an acute lung injury. We certainly know that the people dying across the country a few months ago were mostly people between 17 yeah. and 25 years old. Yeah, I, I looked up some stats before the show and I found out that of the 78 cases just here in Tennessee of lung injury, uh, and this is as of January 2020, 64% were male. The median age of folks to come down with these illnesses was 24. The age range was from 15 to 63, but again, 24 was the median age, and 81% were under 35 years old. We've had two deaths in Tennessee since they've been tracking this, and again, 78 lung injury cases associated with the e-cigarette use, and 69 of those required hospitalization. This is not something to mess around with. And this is, that's also indicative of the fact that the older generation was more inclined to smoke, the younger mm -hmm. generation is more inclined to vape. Uh, the incidence of cigarette smoking we've seen on campus, and I think it's true across the country, is way down uh, now compared to what it was, say, 20 or 30 years ago, but it's been replaced by vaping. Yeah. Dr. Fagans, I wonder if this is something that you now add to the list of things to talk to your patients about, even though you're seeing adults, certainly adults well, are part of this equation. Yeah, when you get a new patient, uh, that's a part of the EMR system now. It's not just do you, you know, smoke cigarettes, yeah. but, you know, they've added do you vape. So mm -hmm. um, it has become a part of the conversation when you take in patients, new patients, as well as your established patients. Do you feel like people are being honest about it, or is there now a stigma associated with it just like cigarette smoking? Well, I think with adults, they're honest about it. Um, I don't think that adults feel that they have to hide anything. Um, with uh, children and teens, they may not mm -hmm. be as forthcoming because they don't want to get in trouble, you know, with the parents. Yeah. Um, they may think that their pediatrician may tell the parents. Um, so I, I don't believe that they're probably as forthcoming as an adult, but I haven't had any issues with any of the adults being honest. Joe, we were talking about during the break some of these devices that you mentioned a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm but they are really sneaky. And you did kind of the show and tell for parents at yes. the forum you hosted at the school. Mm -hmm. 
Tell me about some of those devices. They floored me. Well, so you see the inhalers that, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, it's not uncommon sure. for students to have inhalers and they have devices that look like inhalers. Mm -hmm. um, they have the hoodies are, are kind of a big thing and yeah. they'll use the straw strings of the hoodie as a vaping device. Uh, watches, you can have a watch that has a device in it. Really? Uh, it looks just like a regular um, watch for a student. So there, aside from the, the, what you were talking about earlier with the USB sure. mm -hmm. looking devices, so there's many, many <laughs> devices out there that these How students How many have jaws been. were hitting the floor of these parents? Lots. That was, yeah. kind of the, that was kind of the fun part of the presentation, <laughs> and all the students and the mm -hmm. parents trying to, to, trying to figure out which was the real device and which was the fake device. Have, do, do you feel like there have <clears> been <throat> noticeable differences since you had this, this forum of parents and students and doctors and everybody discussing this issue? Have you seen a difference in the school? I think the noticeable difference is in the communication and in the dialogue that it's created. We're hearing more students talking about vaping and the dangers of vaping. I, we would hear from parents talking uh, to their students and, and being able to mm -hmm. open up that conversation, uh, whereas they may not have felt comfortable having that conversation with their student prior to the uh, us creating a mm -hmm. medical advisory committee and ha hosting that uh, community forum for the parents to be able to come and be educated and learn more about uh, the vaping and the, yeah. and the dangers that are associated with it. Dr. Mangelardo, you mentioned that you have teenage boys. How open and honest have they been with you about the peer pressure they face about this? I mean, you're a lung doctor for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah, and, and absolutely not immune yeah. to the teenagers being attracted to this thing. Uh, two of my boys have not been a, very attracted at all to it. One, one has been, and we've had to constantly counsel and guide, and uh, I think he clearly understands and uh, is away from it now, but mm -hmm. it took a, took a little bit of effort on our part, uh, including testing, yeah. to uh, to keep him away from Just that. Away. The one, the one thing I'd like to emphasize to my kids is that you can take two high school athletes, let's say they're both mm -hmm. 15 years old, they're both on the baseball team or they're both on the basketball team, and they're equally good athletes. One of them starts vaping and one of them doesn't. And the one that starts vaping has potentially developed a lifelong habit. And their lives at that point will start diverging. It won't yeah. be much difference at age 15 or 16 or 17, but 30 years out, one of them may be worried about how he's gonna shave a few seconds off of his per mile time mm -hmm. in the marathon, and the other might be dragging an oxygen tank around, wondering how he's gonna get from the kitchen to the bathroom and where he's gonna stop and rest in between. and and. That's not a calculus that the teenage brain comprehends, no. but it's the reality. And we see it, we see it every mm -hmm. day in patients that have, that made those choices 30 years ago. How do we stop our kids now from making the same bad choices? And the reality is we don't know what those long-term effects are gonna be of vaping. This is yeah. new. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly scary. No, and you know, we didn't know when cigarettes came out what the long-term effects were going to be. The presumption uh, was that cigarettes were safe. The Army, military handed them out with rations. Uh, there were advertisements on television that were legal. Uh, they even you know, advertised that doctors prefer such, such and such a brand. Uh, and uh, obviously that changed, but once, it, once the knowledge came through, it took 40 or 50 years to get the behaviors to change because these things are just so addictive. Yeah. What about secondhand smoke, e-cig smoke? I guess that's a thing. Well, it's still too early, you know, with the research as far as what the effect, long term effects will be from secondhand smoke. Um, years ago when, you know, tobacco was mm -hmm. the thing as far as smoking, we didn't know what the secondhand that you know secondhand smoke could cause lung cancer and COPD and all the other mm -hmm. issues that come with that so it's still you know difficult to see or tell what the long-term effects will be 20 30 years from now mm -hmm. and there's no question that there's a deleterious effect from secondhand smoke with cigarettes right and uh, who knows with these newer products we just don't have the experience yet but the secondhand effect isn't nearly as bad as the first hand effect sure. yeah. and so it's the the user that needs to take a close look at what they're doing and how to make healthier choices what do you tell parents who say okay I know my teen vapes we want that him or her to stop but they can't they're addicted 
What options are there for a teenager? What do you do? Well, I think the first step is perhaps to talk to the to the pediatrician or the or the teenager's doctor and look at alternatives. There are uh, if if you came to me as an adult who was mm -hmm. smoking, I would say the data show there are three things that are effective. Number one, you have to make up your mind that you're going to stop. Number two, you have to set a quit date, and you absolutely have to quit mm -hmm. on the quit date. And then number three, if and only if you can do number one and number two. Uh, there are nicotine replacement products to help get you through the withdrawal symptoms and with smokers under the best circumstances with all three of those things in place the quit rate is in the 40 percent range oh. um, you know Mark Twain said quitting smoking was the easiest thing he ever did and he knew because he had done it a thousand times <laughs> and my patients uh, can certainly attest to that I mean yeah. you know, I have patients that quit they stay off of cigarettes for two or three years and they get back mm -hmm. on cutting down doesn't seem to work uh, I have a lot of patients that say well you know I've come up with a strategy I'm gonna smoke one less cigarette a day every week until I'm off but what happens is they have a bad day they uh, something yeah. something bad happens a family mm -hmm. member gets sick someone dies they, someone gets angry at them at work mm -hmm. they're stressed and then they're right back they've got it in the environment they're right back to smoking a pack a day it's nicer uh, it's you're less likely to revert to smoking if you have to get in your car and drive to the store and buy the cigarettes. And I think that the same thing is going to apply to the vaping products. I think we have to sort of extend what we know from smoking to the same drug delivered another way and through maybe, vaping. Maybe it's just me, but I wonder if other parents would feel the same thing when they say, okay, you've got to stop vaping, but I'm so hesitant to give you nicotine gum or the patch or something to help you back that off. Is that, are you finding that among parents? Is that, or are they like, whatever it takes, we'll do it? Well, I'm not a pediatrician, so I'm not actually seeing pediatric patients, but I, I can understand that being a concern, but if it's done with supervision, mm -hmm. with counseling from the pediatrician or the, the kid's doctor, uh, then I think it's better than just saying, letting them have at it yeah. and vaping. And I also think, you know, with vaping, um, with s students, you know, the tobacco industry made it not just, you know, years ago when they were doing tobacco, it was sexy. Yes. You know, now it's the flavor. Mm -hmm. They have mm -hmm. these different flavors and, you know, they were, they did this to attract the younger, Absolutely. you know, generation. So, you know, make it fruity, make it appealing, you know, mm -hmm. so it makes it a little, you know, and then you add the nicotine component, it makes it a lot more difficult. Well, and, you know, let's be honest, the, the nicotine industry, the cigarette industry knows exactly what they were doing. Exactly. The cigarette smoking rates were going this and then vaping rates like went right. this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Joe, you mentioned early on yeah. about kind of changing the way you punish this on campus mm -hmm. to more of a restorative way. Can you explain that? What changed? Uh, <coughs> we had a policy in place where students may have been uh, suspended or in, in school suspension mm -hmm. for a day um, you know we, we do take you know everything case by case but now it's more about getting that information to them um, uh, trying to sit down with the students and informing them about what they are putting into their lungs uh, bringing their parents on board you know having their parents come in and to talk with their students mm -hmm. uh, to try to help them open up that that conversation uh, with their students and you know seeking medical professional help uh, counseling those types of things uh, if they just if those kids feel like they have uh, somebody in their corner an advocate mm -hmm. we're talking about the addiction and while we have students that are, I would say are addicted to the vaping and the nicotine I still firmly believe that it'd be a lot easier to help a student who's only been vaping for a year or 18 months or even two years uh, to stop as opposed to somebody who's been smoking cigarettes for you know, 20 years or somebody who's been smoking you know, for 10 years, yeah. five years. So I like to think that there's hope for those students and that you know, with the proper management and uh, the proper care. Uh, we can we can help them get off of those devices and then. yeah we've got to turn these numbers around too sure we're going to change that graph okay yeah. we're going to take another quick break when we come back we're going to start talking about the coronavirus if you have questions go ahead and give us a call 615-737-PLUS stay with us